Welcome, everybody. My name is Susan Green. I'm the editor of the Colorado Independent. We're a statewide nonprofit news site um, headquartered here in the Denver Open Media building in Denver. We are all happy to have you here in our live studio audience and anyone who's watching on live stream or listening on the radio for later broadcast or even listening live on the radio, welcome. We're glad you joined us tonight. I want to thank our partners, Denver Open Media, as well as Civic Matters and KGNU Radio, all uh, partners of ours in trying to deliver independent news. And um, when I say independent, I mean truly independent from the um, venture capitalists and other folks who own media in, in the state. Uh, I want to thank our participants so much for being here. Uh, Lisa Calderon, <laughs> Chairman Sekou, Kaylin Rose Heffernan, um, Penfield Tate, Afternoon. and Jamie Gillis. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us. We have one um, candidate on the ballot who is not with us tonight. That's the incumbent, Mayor uh, Michael Hancock, has declined to be with us um, tonight, and we're sorry he's not joining us. Um, the format will be uh, five questions to which each candidate um, will have a minute to respond. In keeping with our desire to make this a no, uh, wait, let's do it again, a no bull debate. <laughs> Uh, we really want, we're giving the candidates three minutes after they all answer the questions to have a, an actual true debate um, between themselves. Um, we're asking that they try to keep it civil, but um, we think that as lively a discussion as we can get, lively slash civil would be terrific. So um, they'll be doing that. They'll then move on to uh, audience questions. After that, each candidate will have a chance to pose a question of one of the other candidates. And then after that, each candidate will have a minute or two to wrap up. The rules, there will be a time clock. We've spoken about this, it's right here. Uh, we are asking you to stay within your allotted time. If you don't, you're going to have me to deal with. And um, we also have other people in the audience who are prepared to stop you if you are um, not abiding it. We really wanna make this as fair as possible. Um, if I cut you off, please, respect that. Also, expect to be challenged from time to time. If you say something that I, as the moderator, think uh, needs some more elaboration um, or is just bull, uh, you might be challenged by me. So, um, and certainly you'll be challenged by your uh, opponents in the debate part of it. So, right now I'm going to ask you all to please introduce yourselves. You have two minutes to do so and let's start with Dr. Calderon. Good evening everyone. I am so glad to be at this forum. I've actually been looking forward to it because I have such respect for the work of Susan Green and the independent media I, I believe have been part of um, all of you all's uh, enterprises because you all have shined the light on government, uh, when government refused to be accountable in this city. And so that is part of the basis of why I am running, um, that I want to make sure that uh, we have an accountable, transparent government with checks and balances. We haven't had that, and I think the fact that Michael Hancock is not here uh, right now is a testament to that, that we have to have um, change in the city where we don't have to fight them for core requests, that we don't have city business being hidden on text messages, um, that we really do need to make a new day in city government. Um, I uh, am a longtime resident of Denver. I was born and raised here. Um, this is my city that I love. And because I love this city, I'm going to fight to defend it. I've been a 30 year uh, public servant, community organizer, um, and have also worked for 15 years on law enforcement accountability issues and 20 years as a nonprofit provider, including direct services, assisting people who are in the margins of this city. And that's what I'm really fighting for, is that we create a city that's for everyone, where everyone can prosper. Uh, right now, we are creating a city for those with access, those without access, and I want to make sure that everybody's voice is at the table, and that's what I'm fighting for. Um, so I look forward to uh, the conversation and the debate. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Chairman Sekou. Yes. Uh, my name is 
Chairman Sekou, and uh, I'm on the ballot as Stefan, quote unquote, Sekou Evans, because they refuse to honor my chosen name. They prefer my slave name. And so since I wasn't, uh, my people, when they came here to America, <coughs> didn't have no choice. See, we went from Kunta to Toby, and if we said Kunta, we get beat. That's how we got our names. So I refused to honor that tradition. So I refused to ask their permission to change it back to what it was before slavery. So I have my slave name that's on the ballot, Stephan, quote unquote, Sekou Evans. And when I ran in 2015, it was just Sekou, period. I was at the top of the ballot. So I'm not new to this thing. And I was born and raised in Five Points on the east side. Spent the last 12 years at city council making over 500 presentations on behalf of poor, working poor, and uh, houseless folks, students, the oppressed. And during that period of time, um, I've attended over a thousand meetings, subcommittee and committee and mayor council meetings, 12 years, on the job, on the case, every day. I'm not a weekend warrior. So I've been doing this for a while. So I look forward to continuing on the dialogue uh, as we go about doing the no bull. Well done. Well done. I'm not through you. I got nine more seconds. Oh, okay. But I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> you must be serious about this. Kaylin. I uh, thank you also for having me. I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been, my name is Kaylin Rose Heffernan. I'm uh, born and raised here in Denver, longtime artist in the city and performer. I've been on this stage a handful of times and have created uh, some really great relationships and art in this same building. Uh, you also made it accessible for me to get on this stage. So I love you all here at Denver Open Media. Have for a long time. Um, I jumped into this race. Uh, I'm the first person rolling for mayor, first person to ever roll for Denver's mayor. Uh, and I got into it as an April Fool's Day joke. Uh, people have always joked that I'm kind of the mayor because I'm recognizable and I'm connected to a lot of communities. Um, but the joke's always been I'm never going to run for anyone or anything. Um, so made a silly video that was highlighting some serious issues that are facing the city and there was nobody representing Denver that I trust or that I... Um, Tr really just trust or have any kind of personal relationship with and so I jumped in as a serious candidate uh, as an artist to reimagine what it means to be a politician to reimagine what it means to campaign to put uh, campaign funds into the community um, and we're rolling out an all accessible platform it's also a poor people's campaign and I don't just mean access to uh, physical access to spaces, but also access to income and wealth, access to housing, access to quality education, uh, access to quality of life, and most importantly, access to creative safe spaces like this one. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Penfield. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to Open Media for hosting um, this event. Um, I'm glad to be back here again and support uh, what, what you do here. I, I think many of us remember that um, this whole enterprise of community TV um, started back in the 80s when Denver first gave the exclusive cable franchise to what was then Mile High Television, but is now Comcast. And so one of the, the things the city demanded in exchange for letting them wire the city is that we have this vehicle where the community could come and produce programming and talk about issues of interest. So it's, I think it's just fitting that we're here today um, to, to have this conversation. My name is Penfield Tate, and I'm here to ask for your support and ask for your vote to be the next mayor of Denver. In my campaign, I've been walking the city and visiting with folks in neighborhoods, and I've heard consistent themes. 
everybody wants change. Everybody's frustrated with how things are, and people want new leadership. And I've told them, as your mayor, I'll bring accessible, ethical, and transparent leadership because that's not what we've had for the last eight years. We have issues that need to be addressed. We're a city that's gentrifying too rapidly. Poor people and people of color are being driven out of the city because of a lack of a desire or any intent to plan creatively and effectively. We have no affordable housing, so people can't afford to live in the city. We have a worse homeless pro pro problem than I think anybody remembers in our history, and our roads are a cluttered mess. Uh, I bring a background of having served in the legislature for six and a half years. I worked on the Joint Budget Committee managing a multi-billion dollar budget. I worked in the office of Mayor Pena when he taught us to imagine a great city. And I served on the cabinet of a governor, Rory Romer, running the Department of State Government. We need to hit the ground running with the new leadership. We need a change. And I bring the experience and the background to do that. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Jamie. Thank you so much for hosting this and for having us here tonight. My name is Jamie Gillis. I'm a candidate for Denver mayor, and I've got a cold, so I'm going to do my best to get through this. Um, I have been honored to be in this race. What an incredible journey it has been. And part of the process that we made a commitment to going into this is to visit all 78 neighborhoods. And we have almost achieved that goal. And it's been incredible to see every corner of the city, to meet people where they are in their neighborhoods, and to talk about the issues facing Denver right now. And I have heard some consistent themes across those visits. But one thing that really struck me was about a week ago I was visiting and a woman said to me, we have failed to invest in our most precious resource in Denver, and that's our people. So that's what this race is about for me. It's about putting people first again, about building community, about protecting our neighborhoods, about re-knitting together this community that has really been impacted and stressed by development and growth that hasn't been planned, that hasn't been strategic, and that has brought with it a lot of consequences. Congestion, affordability, increasing homelessness, damage to our environment. We need leadership that understands that a thriving city is made up of thriving neighborhoods and thriving communities. That quality of life and livability are core to what a city's a responsibility is. So that's why I'm in this race. I've spent my entire career, 16 years, working on urban growth issues. I'm a trained city manager. I'm an urban planner. And I believe there's a pathway forward to get strategic and smart about how Denver continues to evolve, putting people as the core focus. Thank you. Got it, thank you. I'd like to introduce Marcus Giovanni, who is not on the ballot, but is a write-in uh, candidate who has two and a half minutes to introduce himself. Hello, I'm Marcus Giovanni. Is this on? Or I think anyways. so. I prepared a statement for us so that I didn't sound like any of them. I first would like to thank the Colorado Independent Susan Green for allowing me my 2.5 minutes to explain why I did not make the ballot and offer the citizens and candidates, <clears throat> excuse me, when they, how important it is to hold our city officials accountable when they offer citizens and candidates tools to make our lives easier, not only in the election process, but our everyday lives process. And when Deborah Johnson and Drake Ramke are touting the East Side digital platform is the best thing since sliced bread, and we take what Deborah Johnson and Drake Ramby, Ramke to task when they say it works as being true and correct. And the fact that it worked for 99 candidates, but it didn't work for Marcus Giovanni. Marcus, can you speak into the microphone, Mark? Marcus Giovanni. Which brings reasonable doubt that corruption of sorts are going on in the backgrounds um, unknown to the citizens of Denver. As I have said before, Michael Hancock, Jamie Gaelis, Penfield Tate, Lisa Calderon, you have all been categorized as shadow candidates. Google search the meta tags. <coughs> Hashtag Mayor Hancock, these identifiers trigger what it, whenever these candidates talk, 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 my content is used by their campaign use, visits, or again, talk, talk, talk with no platforms. <coughs> Michael Hancock, 
I want to say you have reached peak leadership. And when people go and Google search hashtags, they will see that even when the best opportunity came knocking on your door, your allegiance to party over citizens and the fact you did not call, call me and say, hey, G, that's amazing what you can do. And my people just can't figure out how you do it. And how about letting me help you tell the world about the most powerful city and county of Denver in the world? And the reason why this is called the no bullshit uh, debate is because Michael Hancock couldn't be here for it. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah. So I just wanted to tell you all, thank you so much for letting me have an opportunity. And uh, I love you. I love you, man. You're badass. Thank you very much. And we have a website called we were robbed dot org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, first question. We are going to start on this side with Jamie on this one. As Colorado Public Radio has reported recently, developers and corporate lawyers and lobbyists have had considerable access to Mayor Michael Hancock and his administration, including accompanying him and his entourage on overseas trips that don't really relate to their industries. Would you change this way of doing business at the city, and if so, specifically how? Absolutely. I, I have been saying for months uh, before the story even broke that it's clear there's a pay-to-play um, mentality, a pay-to-play approach that has been pervasive under this administration. You can see it simply looking at who gets the construction contracts and how that's awarded. Uh, clearly, it comes from a leadership approach, what you're going to tolerate, what you're not. And I believe that you know we as mayors have the opportunity to set a big table and invite everybody to it. And that's what I want to do, not the developer voices. I want to hear the community voices. The other thing that I've talked about is how we do our contracting. It used to be that we had a department within the city that managed all of our facilities construction services. And so they manage those projects in-house. Now, under this administration, we contract out that work. So we contract to a firm in, in the Convention Center's case, Trammell Crow, to then manage additional contractors, additional funding going out the door that we could be managing with our okay. staff in-house. Thanks. Penfield. You know, I, I do think it needs to be changed, and I will change it. It's part of having ethical leadership, which is one of the three principles I talked about. When, when you read the article that the articles that Colorado Public Radio did, I, I find the most disturbing thing is the fact that Michael defends what happens by saying, well, it was legal. Well, that doesn't mean it was right, and that doesn't mean it passes the smell test. And when you look around in the context of it, we have the situation at the convention center with clear allegations of bid rigging. The attorney general's investigating. I actually called for the FBI to come and investigate, and that's now spread to the 16th Street Mall. You've got the FBI investigating concession contracts out of DIA, and you've got this looming debacle with the Great Hall where now, you know, it was just reported this week that the project is now going to be close to two years um, beyond schedule and some 60 million over budget. There's a clear problem here. Thank you. Kaylin. Uh, yeah, I also would change this and have noticed a lot of pay to play uh, within this campaign, campaigning process. Um, I think that every contract should uh, be accessible to the community first. Um, and I think that artists and youth should have a role in city contracts um, so that we don't get stuck in the same uh, ugly development that we've seen. Um, I also would prioritize um, local union <coughs> contracts uh, led by women, uh, specifically women of color. Majority of the contracts that are go um, being handed out by the city uh, are men. And I also am very concerned that the same lobbying firm that is getting some really great uh, city contracts and city love is the same lobbying firm that's pushing millions of dollars to fight our homeless uh, population that are also supposed to be part of this community. Thank you. Seku. Yes. Uh, let's be perfectly clear. I was born and raised here in the city county of Denver. I am 67 years old. 
There has never in my life in 67 years that you didn't have a corrupt city government here. As a matter of fact, you had <coughs> Mayor Stapleton and Spears who were grand wizards of the Ku Klux Klan. Now how low can you go? I'm talking about for real. And then you talk about we have a race problem or do we have racists in power? Now, so you name me <coughs> one administration, city council, or mayor that wasn't corrupt and there was scandal written stuff. So now obviously somebody's not real clear about the history. So I was once told to understand the thing and to fix the thing, you must understand it thoroughly. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Maybe you were done, but thanks. I still have two seconds. Lisa. Will we start by not having developer backed candidates saying that they're gonna stand up to developers? That's gaslighting. Um, right now we're having in this mayor's race a battle of the developers, a group who are unhappy with Hancock, who are backing largely Jamie Gillis, and then the mayor's people who want to keep him in power. What we have to do is we have to return power to the people. Um, and we do that by first listening to the people. So for example, um, after uh, Mayor Hancock, I, have, I lead in the number one contributions from individual donors. Um, lots of people giving a little of what they can. That's how we build our democracy, that everyone has a voice regardless of their bank, ac bank account or their income or their relationship with the mayor. I would also have independent agencies so that uh, our contracts are not politicized based on how close you are to the mayor's office. So that's checks and balances. Thank you. So I'm going to open up this up to debate. There have been some suggestions, some overtly by Seku and some maybe more diplomatically, that this is a corrupt administration. Um, how corrupt do you all feel it is? Very, very well, corrupt. Well, you I know, there, there's, there's some other things that came out in the article that I think ought to disturb folk. And whether people want to call it corruption or not is, is up to them. You know, when, when Michael defended the practice of accepting $22,000 worth of Bronco tickets from Pat Hamo, um, he said, well, it's okay because I don't directly make the decision on what he's doing. Somebody else in my administration does that. Well, you know, my immediate concern was, are you outsourcing leadership to other people in government or to third parties or some of these contractors who become your project managers? You know, we elect a mayor to run the city and be responsible, whether you like it or not, for everything that happens in the city. You don't get to throw someone else under the bus and say it's their fault. I didn't know what they were doing. You're supposed to know what everybody you appoint and the people who work for them are doing. And, and I found that disturbing. I think the mayor's under a large amount of influence from all these lobbyist firms. And it's clear, having worked in community work, trying to work on projects with the city, that. Um, it's not, there's not a clear process to have communication with the mayor's office on urban issues, on city issues. It's, it's about who you know. If you want to get to the mayor, you have to find ways to circumvent the system or get to somebody that's connected to him. And that's how he has always operated. And I find it concerning that in his response last night during the Nine News debate, his defense was, well, these have been my friends for 20, 30 years. And you always rely on your friends to do that. No, when you run a city, you rely on people who know how to run departments, who, who are leaders in their different fields, and you bring the best people to bear to run the city. Okay, you know, but I, I, I don't think this is a question of whether it's our responses are overt or covert or diplomatic. See, diplomacy, a diplomat is nothing more than a professional liar representing this government. <laughs> So I'm not, I'm not a liar, I don't do that. I'm not a diplomat at all, I don't lie. I just tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Because uh, the truth is, uh, as Dr. King said, only truth comes set us free from all this. And now the bump has turned into a, a pimple and it's busting all over the place. I mean, it's pus everywhere. I mean, in all areas of this thing, there's pus just everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. And everybody's wanting to dabble on the pus you know what I'm saying, and clean it up, you know what I'm saying? But what we need to do is look at what started the bump in the first place, see? 
Because this, we have changing faces. This administration, this corruption has been going on for six or seven years in my life. They don't tell how long it's been going on forever. But it's like, what you got to do is get to it where you don't have no bump. You know what I'm saying? It goes unattended, then it turns into pus, Kay. and then everybody wants to clean it up dip got diplomatically. It. Good. We've got 10 seconds left. One uh, of you. I, I think we've seen a real coordinated effort uh, across the city and our funding that is keeping poor people out. And I, what I see is uh, history repeating itself and how this city was colonized and killed and stolen from people without uh, the access to those diplomats. Um, and now we're seeing those cycles repeat themselves. Got it. I'm going to go mm -hmm. to the next question. Y guys, you don't need to ask my permission to speak. Just <laughs> speak. Got this it. is a debate. I don't want you no trouble. Okay. No, I d I d <laughs> look, the PUS thing, it stayed squarely in the FCC regulations. So thanks for that. <laughs> next question, we're going to start with Penfield. What tangible measures would you take, if any, to make Denver more accessible to people with mobility disabil disabilities? You know, I, I think what what needs to happen is, and it's simple things, um, we have 40% of the city with no sidewalks. We ought to work with neighborhoods and install sidewalks in that the, that 40% of the city with no sidewalks. We need to make sure the curb cuts are right um, so that you have access with wheelchairs or other forms of mobility. I'm a big proponent of um, at the lights and the crossing areas that, number one, you ought to be able to reach the button to push across the street from a wheelchair, which when Caitlin and I did the, the, the um, mobility challenge, we, we saw several intersections where she wasn't able to hit the button. But the other thing is, I think the crosswalks ought to have some audible signal to go with the, the sound. Uh, with the light, I have a daughter who's visually impaired and she can't see the light from across the street. And so it would make sense, it would help her to hear the sound and you know, you hear it gets faster and faster as it crosses the street. And we need to look at transit overall. I'm a big proponent of shuttle buses with, within neighborhoods and between neighborhoods to sort of reduce the number of single occupant car trips. Thank you. Kaylin, let it rip. Well, I have a lot of experience in this here uh, topic of Fort Bay. Uh, I actually just got stuck coming here on a flagstone sidewalk uh, because they had the city uh, gave incentives to put flagstone in front of your house and we have not repaired any of those. The troubling thing is that we're seeing access be provided in these new developments and these new spaces that have a lot of income and wealth that the city is prioritizing that most people with disabilities can't afford to be in. If you're living on disability, you can't get more than $800 a month. Um, and so finding affordable housing, let alone accessible housing, is a nightmare. Uh, so we have to address housing, but I also uh, take the bus and take the public transportation. Uh, I'm part of the group that made RTD is the first accessible in the country, and we are eliminating access to communities of color all the time. So we need free, affordable, accessible transportation. Thank you. Seku. Yes. Uh, me and Caitlin are the only candidates that ain't got no money. <laughs> so we're already disabled in the process because it's not a fair process, and life is not fair. And so we're both at the poverty level. And for the first time in history, you have two candidates who are actually poor seeking to be at the table of power to determine the policy. We don't want folks talking for us no more. We want to do it ourselves. Now, one of the things that me and Caitlin have looked at in this process, because we ain't got no money, is like, but we have to be recognized as human beings. And to be in this process, I've been arrested twice just because I wasn't on the stage. Finally, folks got it, see? Because now there's a class action suit in the process, see? And I'm not playing, see? Because now we're talking power. And power speaks to power through pocketbook diplomacy. Thank you, Lisa. I think what um, Kaylin has highlighted in this mayor's race is um, the fact that we have not centered the voices of people in the disability community. That when the city does planning, um, it's not doing it with the people who are most impacted. 
And so um, I would strive for a citywide universal design, which is that you know, when you design uh, something for people with disabilities, you're actually designing it for all of us. For those of us who are temporarily able-bodied, eventually we'll need to use those facilities as well. So when we come from that standpoint of serving people with um, the most kind of intersecting or complex issues, then we are really, uh, again, elevating all of us. So I'd want to, instead of um, uh, you know, city folks thinking what we know is best, to actually put people in charge who actually have had these experiences uh, and can better inform city policy. I, I want to open this debate with a oh, little. Jamie didn't. Oh, I'm so question. sorry, Jamie. That's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, agree with so much of what's been said. And I actually uh, worked with the city on accessibility issues and found that there is no place that the accessibility issue conversation lives within the city. Public works deals with it, planning deals with it. And so that's a conversation that's, that we need to have. We need to have a point person, a department, an agency that's actually looking at accessibility across the board, whether it's for parks, whether it's for our sidewalks, whether it's for how we do development, and is thinking about the big picture. Um, and we need to make sure that we're investing in that and that that person is coordinating it. I would also add to the conversation that in addition to better pedestrian infrastructure and transit, that we also need to deal with how we do construction in the city. I know the city's been looking at it, but blocking off sidewalks and access um, to wheelchairs in that process needs to be taken care of. Got it, thanks. I wanna open this debate first just to give Kaylin, a, I saw an eye roll when Seku said, yeah, we're both disabled because we're poor. You might want to say something about that. And then I want you all to go into the issue of other disabilities, including um, uh, cognitive disabilities mm -hmm. and, and mental illness and um, how the city has treated those issues. But Kaylin, do you want to speak to that um, little comment? Sure. Um, you know, I think that having a disability does prevent you from access. Uh, we live in an inaccessible world. So uh, I guess, what about when you're disabled and poor? You know, uh, you poverty, poverty isn't, isn't uh, a disability in my, in my term. Uh, however, um, disability is at the intersection of all the intersections. Um, disability, as Lisa said, does affect everyone. Uh, it it's it intersects with every other marginalized socioeconomic group. It intersects with every race, ge gender, class, sexual identity, and so when those other marginalized communities intersect with disabilities, we are commonly left out, even at an exponentially uh, at an exponential rate. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that the the saying is nothing about us without us and so we have to be leading these conversations and we cannot we've seen people time and time again speak for us and speak on behalf of us be allies but that doesn't actually reflect what we would do for ourselves got it thanks opening it up more broadly to all disabilities in so, general so let's do this let's do this see i want to be real clear all right the primary enemy of humanity is poverty this ability is a symptom of that because people who are poor do not get the adequate medical services that they need in order to assume a, a role of normalcy in society. So we have to, for instance, I don't got no money to buy no wheelchair. So if it's not provided by the people, what do I do? I can't lay in the bed all life. I can't surrender life. I can't be a victim. So I have to figure out a means of way how to make that happen. So, but if I have money, then being in a wheelchair ain't that much of an issue because I can go get one with a motor scooter back on it and roll through this thing. No, Got no, it. no, Seku, that's not right. I'm sorry. Um, there is a difference between poverty and physical or mental disability. No, you're um, not no, hearing me. That's no, not no, what I said. That's not let, what I said. Finish. So quote what I said. No, no, let me finish because I didn't interrupt you. And if you have a disability, depending on the nature of the disability, having money may put you in a better position to cope with it, but it doesn't necessarily cure it because what you have is systemically 
in the community, in society, daily barriers and obstacles that you have to overcome because you never have enough money to remake and rebuild an entire town, an entire country, an entire world to accommodate the particular disability that you may have. Ten seconds left. No, no amount of money will no, turn let me this tell you something. Scary. Ain't nothing like being hungry, all right? <laughs> you can't, you what you get, you can't hold eat. Up, I don't care up, how you roll up. through this thing. No There's amount of money. basic things in That's poverty. Wrapping that it up. supersedes well, all of that. Next you can't question. Eat. It don't do no good to have no wheelchair. Next Let's talk about the real question. Talk Denver City Auditor, we're starting with you, Kaylin. Denver City Auditor has just released a report that finds the city lacks, quote, cohesive overall strategy in its approach to combating homelessness through the Road Home collaboration, and that staffing at Road Home has been stretched thin down to just seven people. <coughs> what specifically would you do to address these problems? Yeah, uh, the homelessness issue is probably one of the biggest reasons also why I decided to turn my joke into a serious candidacy. Uh, I've seen our homeless people be killed. Uh, these are not just uh, statistics for me. These are my friends. These are my family. These are artists in our community. Um, these are students of mine, actually, currently this week, uh, who are homeless. And so I would like to first and foremost declare housing a human right. Um, I would overturn the urban camping ban day one. Um, I am in full support and endorse Initiative 300 to give homeless people basic human rights because we're not going to solve anything for anyone if we don't see them as humans. Uh, I would also like to allocate the empty vacant spaces and city spaces that we are sitting on, including some of these funds that aren't being allocated to homeless people. Same with nothing about us without us, homeless people or uh, previous homeless people should be leading this initiative. Thanks. Seku. <coughs> okay. Listen. We don't have a homeless issue. We have a houseless issue because this earth belongs to all human beings. This is the only home we got. Mm. Planet Earth. Period. So now quit sanitizing the deal. Mm. We need houses for these folks. Now you got a housing thing here. There ain't no crisis. It's a real estate deal. You got 20,000 units of luxury housing that's unoccupied that the city could buy, already built. Now you ask me, where's the willingness of that? And where's your priorities on the budget? Because we don't have to wait no 100 days to fix this. It don't take 100 days to do that because that's what they did during the recession. When they packaged all of these houses in foreclosures, the banks did and sold them to developers. And you didn't even know it was being done because there was no for sale signs on anybody's house. So we can do this here. Now the question is, what you do for the rich, will you do for the poor? Will you do for the disabled? Would you get them a place or would you rather see them die outside for a real estate deal with nobody in it? Okay, cutting you off. Lisa. Denver's Road Home was actually started uh, under Mayor uh, Hickenlooper and uh, with the intention of um, not per perhaps too aspirational of ending homelessness, but at least setting a goal. When Mayor Hancock then came in, he deprioritized that because it wasn't his initiative and so he wasn't invested in keeping it going. As a result, he put one of his crony friends in the position over Denver's Road Home and ran it into the ground and depleted the funds. Uh, that man then just got promoted laterally to a six-figure job and is currently working at the Sheriff's Department. So if we're going to actually prioritize homelessness, what I would do is actually um, appoint uh, qualified experts who actually know how to use evidence-based practices. Um, I've implemented housing first models. I don't just talk about them um, and know that it's um, a complicated process and we have to replenish those funds that have been depleted uh, in, in Denver's Road Home. Thanks, Jamie. We, um, it, start, it starts by understanding, you know, as people have mentioned up here that the last eight years has brought really no action on homelessness. And on top of that, the urban camping ban really created a divide um, between the administration and the homeless community. So we need to repair that. Everybody does deserve dignity. And it is a housing first model that we have to adopt. Um, but we need to invest in our, in our people. So it's gonna be immediate short-term solutions for getting people to housing tiny home villages, uh, sanctioned camping sites. San Diego has utilized tent structures. 
We need to get pl people to places where then we can deliver coordinated services. And ultimately, we're going to have to work with partners to develop housing that has wraparound supportive services. And jobs and getting people to job um, opportunities is also something we need to be focused on doing. Thanks. Penfield. Okay. Uh, you know, the auditor is exactly right. And I think the quote you used was, co lack no cohesive overall strategy to deal with homelessness. And this administration has no cohesive overall strategy to deal with a host of things, including affordable housing. But well, let's talk about homelessness for a moment. Um, clearly what we've seen, and even what Michael admitted on the, the, the debate last night, is that the camping ban doesn't work. Uh, the homeless sweeps, and they are sweeps, despite what he says. They don't work, and they don't solve the problem. What's more distressing is our tax dollars get wasted because we get sued by a, a class action lawsuit by homeless advocates over a policy that doesn't work, and we have to settle the lawsuit. So I've got a plan on my website at tapefordenver.com. In the first 100 days, this is my priority. We have to accelerate approving shelter space. We have to acquire property to build more shelter space. And we need to look at creating outdoor encampments. Los Angeles has even done something like that successfully. Got it. So opening this up for debate, please. You heard yes. the that you please. You've heard the mayor say last night that the urban camping ban doesn't work. Um, this is at the end of his second term. Uh, we've all seen these videos of these sweeps. Many people have been victim of those sweeps. Um, what's your response to his his response? And um, what do you want people to know about the? attitude that this uh, administration seems to have publicly about homelessness and um, has in practice? They don't care. They, they don't care. Having tried to push on a number of fronts to address the homelessness issue, it has been, you know, right from the mayor's office and, and staff that surround him, we're not interested. And yet, they, the mayor talks about he he kind of condescendingly corrected me at a forum the other night. The budget says we spend $14 million on homeless services. He says it's 50. If we're spending $50 million a year on homelessness and the problem is getting worse, then there's something very wrong with the system. Um, but most of that money we know is going to policing. It's going to sweeps and cleanups. And it's going to um, EMT services. But it's not actually going to solving the problem. And I can't figure out why, but it has been a very confrontational situation between this administration and the homeless community, well, it, and it has to end. It's not a priority. The mayor's right about one thing. The homeless sweeps don't work, which is why they have used fewer and fewer of them. And Jamie's right. If you look at the city's budget page, it does say that only $14.7 million are going to homeless services. And I think that is probably the right number. The problem is there is no comprehensive plan because really the, the intention behind sweeps and bans is to address a cosmetic issue. You have some people in the community that don't want to see homeless people on the street. But rather than address the real issue, which is solve the problem, mm -hmm. the money and time and energy and political will is being invested in hide the problem. Get it out of view so we don't have to think of it out of sight, out of mind. And that's the fundamental problem with the approach. You know, I've debated with the mayor over this issue, and he keeps telling me it's the most difficult thing he's had to deal with. Well, you know, eight years on city council, eight years in the mayor's office, 16 years is long enough to figure out how to fix a problem. I find it interesting, too, in one of these debates, he exposed that um, this was actually, actually a reactionary measure to Occupy Denver, um, which I saw every time that they erected a quote-unquote tent, which was actually just a canopy, to feed people called the Thunderdome, riot police came out in full force. We're talking 300 plus riot cops, tear gas, you name it. And that was for feeding people. And so what they did is they got around with all the businesses in town and they slipped in this, uh, this bill, the urban camping bill. And there's people in town that are feeding homeless people every week for the past week uh, for the past seven years, every week since the urban camping ban has been enacted. You know, when I think about this mayor's position, and I've told him directly that um, I find that his approach to um, the urban camping ban is immoral. 
Um, and I think it's very telling that within um, the second year of an office that that was basically um, his um, cornerstone initiative. And when we have a city budget that is 40%, almost 40% uh, public safety, I think that reflects the values of this city. So what, what we do know, and as a criminal justice professor and also running um, Denver's reentry program for eight years, is that it's always more expensive mm. on the back end after you've incarcerated people and used our jails as mental health facilities, which they are not equipped to do, instead of investing in the front end. Um, and I think, you know, as mayor, that I would relook at those priorities so that we're actually doing more prevention um, than incarceration. Got it. So Thanks. That's a good segue. We're out of time on okay. that question. Wait, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, but it's a debate and you gotta but kinda, he's got to. Some of that? It's a village. I so, um, next question, and it's a good segue <laughs> into the Sheriff's Department. Um, we have reported at the Colorado Independent that it, I think at the time of Ferguson, for example, the city had paid out more in civil rights. Um, either jury awards or settlements in excessive force cases than Baltimore um, or than St. Louis or, I mean, there have been, there's been the Marvin Booker killing, there was the Michael Marshall killing shortly after the new sheriff took place. We've been promised massive reforms. They've spent tens of millions of dollars on reforms in this department. Uh, so many years, so many experts, we still have overcrowding, we still have violence, we still have understaffing. How specifically would you reform the Sheriff's Department? Your turn. Really, this, I will move my office from Bannock into the Sheriff's Department into the jail. That's my office. There'll be no disrespect in my office, there won't be no killing, there'll be no disrespect to officer inmates, inmates office, that's inappropriate office behavior. I'll be there. All right, and I'm committed to being there from the first thing in the morning at 9 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night, and then I'm going to have me a bunk there. I'm going to wake up there, and I dare you to come in here and kill somebody in my office. I dare you to hear me some cries and out, and I dare you to disrespect that sheriff because, see, he got a job. And see, there's a high divorce rate amongst city employees because of the pressure and stress that we got to deal with. So everybody gonna get back to some common sense, some common decency, and if you disrupt the decorum of my office, guess who's my deputy mayor? Bubba. Yeah, he gonna toss that salad, and I bet you you don't do that no more. There'll be no cases, there'll be no log jams in the court. We're gonna fix that right now, and then guess what? I guarantee you, through action, I can teach you a quicker way of thinking Lisa. than you can think your way to another way of action. Lisa, We're talking bubble you're now. done. Lisa. So I don't think it's a joking matter about the crisis that's happening in our jails. People are suffering in there. Um, we have people who are not uh, able to um, get the, the kind of help and support that they need. I know working in there day in and the day out, uh, running a reentry program, um, these are very complex issues. And when we see the intersection of mental illness, addiction, poverty, uh, essentially come and collide within jails, and then we don't have the resources um, to address those issues. It's, um, it's a setup for failure. I mean, that downtown jail is a tinderbox um, waiting to explode. So we need to as address it with all urgency. So one thing I would do is, one, hire a sheriff who had actually been a sheriff before, not a third string sheriff um, who this mayor had hired. I'd have community input, um, but I also have a, a manager of safety who didn't have eight jobs in nine years before he was appointed to oversee it, and remove that authority from the mayor's office essentially running our jail, and that's what's happening now. Jamie. Well, I agree that we need a different sheriff with experience, that um, we have to be very careful about hiring people that have actual experience in, in fixing these issues. But ultimately, the mayor appoints all of these people, the head of the safety department, the police, uh, police chief, the, the, the sheriff. And when you talk to the deputies, they believe that there is um, a challenge within the mayor's office of actually wanting to fix some of the issues. So I think we need real leadership in addressing that. 25% of the people that are in the jails don't really need to be there. Um, every crime in Denver is jailable. That's a bizarre factoid. You can get jailed for jaywalking, you can jail get jailed for not paying a ticket. So we used to have homeless court. We used to have community service. Um, we need to figure out how to not criminalize things that don't need to be criminalized. We also need to make sure that we're bringing in people who are trained. All the deputies are being trained now. 
are being video trained. They're not having direct experience. Penfield. You know, your issue, I think, is a, is a good one, but I think it's bigger than that. The Department of Safety is important because that tends to be the group of the population that has direct contact with the public, and often that contact is for difficult situations, fires, crimes, and some other um, issue. Uh, and it's important that leadership set the right tone. That's why I started talking about accessible and ethical and transparent leadership. You can't oversee a department of safety with the mantra, do what I say, not as I do. So when you have a mayor who himself has cost the taxpayers close to $300,000 because he's sending inappropriate text to a police officer on a security detail, and you have other police officers charged with sexual harassment, and you have the highest ranking women in the department suing for harassment, and you have the fire, uh, the fire lieutenant putting cameras in women's offices or rooms, what sort of culture are you creating, and how can you as the mayor hold anybody else responsible, whether it's for killing people who are incarcerated or being held, or any other reason when you aren't behaving properly? Got it, thanks. Uh, I also agree that we need a different sheriff, and I would like to see the entire public safety uh, department redistributed uh, uh, into a trauma-informed crisis response team. Um, I know that we have to ha we have to keep our police there for like really dangerous situations, and not policing our youth, our youth of color, um, our people experiencing disabilities. Many of the people that you named uh, had a disability of some sort. The youth community is still grieving um, and have a lot of trauma around Jesse Hernandez killings and Ryan Ronquillo. Uh, and right now there's a officer who put, got put on 10 day suspension for illegally going through the database to look up a sex worker who has now been found dead. Uh, so we need a public safety uh, leader, uh, including the sheriff, that uh, comes from a restorative justice lens. Got it, thanks. I just want to make a correction of facts. So, um, and I appreciate Jamie's sentiment about we basically are in hyper-criminalization with too many laws, but jaywalking isn't a criminal offense. Um, I think that we do need to focus on some of those um, uh, offenses that do need to be decriminalized. And um, Penfield, just to, to add to your point, um, you know, Mayor Hancock's sexual harassment has actually cost taxpayers 1.5 million in terms of um, the settlements, the secret settlements. So that's one of the things I would do is stop secret settlements. If you sexually harass someone, you're gonna pay for it out of your own pocket. Okay, good. Next question. Speaking of really dangerous situations, I, Susan Green, I'm one of several people who've been harassed, to put it mildly, by Denver police simply for taking pictures or video of them doing their jobs on public sidewalks or streets. How do you think the Hancock administration has handled this issue and what, if anything, would you do to protect the public's and the press's First Amendment rights in this city? Is you first. And no, we're uh, oh, starting sorry. with Lisa. Okay, cool. So Thanks. Susan, I want to commend you for um, videotaping and, and putting that out there to the public view and, and that you also acknowledge that this is what often communities of color have to go through constantly and don't necessarily get the kind of media attention that Susan got. Um, and as a result, I, you know, it really elevated the issue that communities of color are overly surveillanced. Um, and when we, um, so, so part of um, what I would, is what I've been doing for the past 15 years, is to increase transparency of officers. The use of body cameras, I think it's a good start, but not all officers are required to use body cameras. Um, so if you're on a SWAT team, which is some of the most dangerous interactions you can have with people, they're not having body cameras. Um, uh, command staff, uh, so only certain officers, and then we also need to have um, body cameras on uh, for deputies in the jail. This is also something that they, um, there's cameras, but there's no sound. So there's many things that we can do to increase transparency. Jamie. I think it also starts with, with a culture conversation. I mean, how are, what the culture is within the police department and how that culture goes through in terms of training and so forth leads to how people, how the police department interacts with the public. Um, I, I think there's a lot of work still to do. It's very clear. But I do think that there are some positive steps being made. I met with Chief Pazin. He talked about the incident that you had and how it is changing how they train officers to deal with different situations. 
I think acknowledging and, and movements like, um, you know, the situation you had becoming very public are, are part of it. But we, we truly have to have a conversation about what's the culture of policing? How do we want our police to interact with our community? What type of training do they need to do that? Obviously, body cameras. Um, and what types of tools do they need to ensure that they're dealing best with the public? Thanks. Ken. Uh, it, well, first I commend you for, for posting and videotaping what you went through. That never should have happened, number one. You saw and observed a situation firsthand where the police were probably overdoing um, the efforts that were necessary to figure out what was going on with the gentleman they had encountered. And you made it clear that there was no doubt that there was an intent to chill the press's ability to cover the issue and let it be known that the police had gone overboard yet once again. So, you know, I talked about three, type, three pieces of leadership that I think are important that I'll bring to the job, accessible, ethical, and transparent. And we need a free and independent press to ensure the transparency. I get disturbed with the issues we've also had with the police department where open records requests have been filed, have not been complied with, and then suits are brought and it turns out we have to pay another settlement because someone hid or didn't produce all of the records. You shouldn't have to file an open records request to know what our government is doing when it's public in the first place. Kaylin. Yeah, um, also commend you for all the work that you do um, for the whole community and I think that the the, the uh, public safety department should actually be taking tours and training right here in Denver Open Media and with uh, independent journalists um, and again having artists um, I consider you journalists uh, writers and art big piece of our, our community um, that we wouldn't have access to the truth uh, without you um, and so I think we have to have artists uh, involved in all of these steps uh, we don't have a trust relationship between the community and our public safety um, and that's there's a reason for that and when the people in power aren't held accountable uh, they are easy it's a lot easier for them to get away with uh, the things that are supposed to be illegal so I would, I would push for them having a one-on-one -on -one training with you. Thanks. Chairman Seku, bring yeah. it home. I'm the only one here on the stage that has any experience with reforming the police. When I was 17 years old, I joined the Black Panther Party. We reformed the police. We stopped the killing in our neighborhood when we started killing cops. And we couldn't get to jail without getting beat. Not only in this town, but in Oakland and all the rest of the state. So we took on a campaign to stop the beating, and we would follow you the police car to the jail to make sure you got there, read your rights, all right? And they stopped a lot of that, and what happened? We stopped doing that, and now they're back again. So there ain't but one thing that you can do, for real, other than point your finger at somebody and say, hey, you're not doing this, 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 because there's three more pointing back at you, because you ain't got no solution to that. The only ones that can reform the police is the police, because they know who the beast is. Not all cops are bad cops. So then you need to incentivize the police department by coming up with a war for teams for $1 million, which means that your job is to police the police. So if you see somebody harassing the, uh, her on the media, then you step in uh, and sorry, stop that. You're over time. Police need to you're stop over time. police. You're over time. Okay. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Got three minutes. You know, we have had some reform efforts, but they don't go far enough. Yeah, I, I, I co-chaired the committee that created the Office of the Independent Monitor, which was an important step, and that was something we did do, to say Ku's point, cooperatively with the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, the DA, and more importantly, the community, because there wasn't transparency, there wasn't accessibility, and quite frankly, there was tension between the the safety department and the community. So the independent monitor's office mm -hmm. was supposed to be a way to do two things. Help the community raise grievances in a safe environment about being over-policed that could be dealt with. And number two, to give the police some ability to, to sort of police their own ranks and deal with some of the people who they knew were bad actors. But that office has been weakened, unfortunately, since it was originally created. 
And I also worked on justice reform issues um, to remember that the reason why the Independent Monitor's Office was created was from community outcry, the killing of Paul Childs, a 15-year-old um, mentally disabled youth, uh, black teen in Park Hill. Um, since that uh, office, that community fought for was implemented, under this mayor, he tried, repeatedly has tried to dismantle it and diminish, diminish the powers of the independent monitor. Um, but because community rose up again and to say, you know what, um, our intention is for the independent monitor to also investigate line officers, not just, or I'm sorry, command staff and not just line officers, um, then we fought uh, this mayor's office again. So, I, so, I, one, question, so one of the deals, one, one of the deals, one of the deals, one of, one of the deals, one of and we're just jumping in now, right? Jump in, people. Right, well, well, ladies I, first, ladies first, go ahead. I just had a question, since you were both involved in that office. The appointment of, of Nick Mitchell um, to run the office, um, the mayor has a heavy hand in how the Office of the Independent Monitor works. Structurally, don't we need to change that? Because it's not right. truly independent, and why was it set up that way in the first place? Well, the real, the real reason why it was set up that way is to distract the people and the energy away from the problem. Listen, you got to be for real about this, all right? We got intellects who are very, very smart, don't get me wrong, but they ain't got no boots on the ground training. You got folks who ran programs, all right? Programs. Now, ask yourself a question. With a program to stop police brutality, if you stopped it, you're out of business. You don't get no more grants. So why would you work against your own interest? That's bullshit. Oh, excuse me, Pete, that's oh. bullshit. Pete. All right, so we can stop all of that now. We can stop all of that now, all right, because we're going to tell the truth up in here, all right? We got people who never, ever experienced what they're talking about. See, None of that. See. And two, their lifestyles is tied into these programs to help us, and then the truth is they co-conspirators to the game because they're lying and they're bull, Please, Lisa. So, Jamie, the reason why it was set up that way is actually because the city resisted a, a truly independent system. And so what we've seen is incremental change to try to get it toward independence. Um, and so yes, we need an independent monitor who is not appointed by the mayor. And that I think is the next step um, in true accountability. But that's the way it was set up is because the city resisted true independent monitoring. It was supposed to be independent okay. um, yeah. with subpoena power and a host of other yeah, things. I, I, I gotta cut this debate it. off. I'm sorry, Penn. Sorry, Seku, cutting it off. So we're now doing, um, segueing very seamlessly into the audience questions. And um, we've had que questions submitted via, from the live audience and via um, social media. and. We were just talking about First Amendment rights um, and a little bit about the um, uh, role of the media in the city. And we're sitting in a building, um, the Denver Open Media Building. Denver had the con Open Media had the contract for the city's public access channels that was taken away a couple months ago by the mayor's administration. Um, they are now going to. It's unclear what they're going to do with the public access station um, that. Uh, I know you all know a bit about, and I want to ask you, what is your opinion about the city terminating that contract? And uh, what, if elected, would you do moving forward with that contract? Oh, uh, jump in. Go, jump in. All right, here we go, here we go. First uh, of all, <laughs> the media's got to quit being hypocrite, all right? They took away our right to participate. I hear nothing from the media, nothing from the station. There was no conversation, there was no public release. But yet you knew what was happening all, but you want us to protect your right, but you ain't never did nothing to protect our right to be in this election. So you can stop being a hypocrite. You did nothing, nothing but get in bed with it and silence it. So what you have to do is get correct with yourself. Instead of blaming other people about things, what about you? What are you, what is the media doing now to protect the rights of people in their First Amendment right? When you go to the war and you accept the fact that you can't go to the battlefield like you went in Vietnam and you report that mess over here and we don't get to Okay, you're cut off. Okay. Others. Yeah. There is a war on the media, a war against uh, good media, good journalism by this administration without a doubt. And we need to restore that contract. We absolutely need to bring that back. We need public access. We need opportunities for people to tell their stories. Because this, even in this mayoral race, I, we've heard across the city, people don't know what's going on. They're not getting information. We need good opportunities to share the stories of the city. You, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kim. Uh, I was one of the hundreds, maybe thousands of artists who um, did deliver a, a 
letter to the mayor asking him to renew the lease. Um, I'm glad this came up. I was going to save it for the closing remarks if it didn't, uh, because I've created some really important art in this in this building um, with you all and the people that are working here right now are working overtime they're losing money every day just to keep this place open and we're not going to have a thriving city or a thriving culture without a place to create art and to create independent media okay i'm going to cut this question off and do another audience question considering the taxpayers have spent love you considering the taxpayers have spent 1.5 million dollars to settle mayor hancock's and his sexual harassment related claims, how would you go about strengthening protections for women employees in city government? So that's one of the cornerstones of my campaign. When I look at the pillars of equity, fairness, and justice, under equity, I look at the populations that have not been heard in this city, and that's women, workers, and residents. And when we look at how women have been treated in this administration, um, I hear frequently from women who say, you know, I'm afraid to report because seeing what happened with Mayor Hancock not being held accountable, why would I? Or I did report and I lost my job. Um, and so I would want to uh, strengthen sexual, um, uh, sexual harassment discrimination protection uh, for women because it interferes with your uh, economic opportunity uh, when you are denied opportunity because you reported something. I also think there's a culture that is permissive to say it wasn't a big deal. And so the fact that the mayor has not taken full responsibility, I mean, really, we know what sexual harassment is. Um, and so for him to uh, harass a subordinate and say he just simply crossed the line is unacceptable. It'd be unacceptable in a business environment. He'd be fired. And so he deserves to lose his job. There are these okay, two, so let's, two let's, things. Let's talk, two let's things. talk about this for a second. Go ahead, Jamie. So um, the, there's, first of all, I, I had brought up in a previous debate that there is no true anonymous reporting, particularly against um, your boss in, and uh, some of the department heads in the city. The mayor contradicted me on that, but I went and verified. There are places to report, but it doesn't, it, it, people have not been truly treated anonymously. And when you're talking about a superior or one of the political appointees, it's very hard. The second thing I want to say is I will absolutely commit to um, introducing, working with city council to introduce legislation that says we cannot use taxpayer dollars to pay out sexual harassment suits anymore. The taxpayer's money should not be used to settle those. That should have been settled with Michael Hancock's own money. Got it. Okay, so here we go, here we go. Wait, wait, wait. I've been very patient. Wait. Now, we got to be real clear on this, and that's why y'all ain't never been down. Now, you don't even know what, what went down. There's a couple of things that went down. One, the city attorney acted as if he was Michael's personal attorney. That's illegal. He represents the city. It's That's a, a city job. It's a That's woman. a city it's a job. Woman. So he should have he should have got reprimanded too, and he should have been fired and went to jail. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, city council signed off on it. They didn't do the research. They didn't even know. So they a co-conspirator in it too. Even Susan said if she'd have known what she didn't know, well then she would have done that. But why did you do that? What's your potential responsibility Pen. to yeah. handle the money? Now, hey, now you're done. Two other, two other things need to happen. Number one, we need to do a better job of recruiting, particularly in the safety department. At this point, only 11% of police officers are women, only 5% of firefighters are women, and you see the problems we have in those departments. If you change the context, if you change the mix, you'll get another result. Secondly, when I was on the board of Denver Water and I was president for a period of time, we did something that had never been done before. We established an office of an independent monitor, and we actually established an employee hotline, an anonymous hotline, that is monitored by our independent monitor so that if employees have issues, they can phone in anonymously to that hotline, and it gets investigated by a group that is not under the direct control or management of the CEO, but reports directly to the board of Denver Water, Thanks, and it's worked. Kaylin. If we're 51% of the population and have been since the beginning of mankind, <laughs> we should occupy 51% of the power in this city at the very least. Got it. One, one last audience question. What specific policies would you pursue to help Denver become a leader in environmental stewardship? Well, I would um, invest in the Office of Sustainability, which this administration has not done. It is under-resourced. Um, less than $400,000 of the city's budget goes to sustainability. 
Uh, I was the first mayoral candidate to come out in support of the Green New Deal because I believe that we have to act with urgency uh, to get to a net zero uh, carbon uh, economy, um, but also because it has uh, stipulations for a just job transition. And we have to be able to address the f those folks, the marginalized communities who are most vulnerable to environmental degradation, and that's where I would first start to focus my resources. Are we going in an order? No, just it's a debate. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, I think city buildings ought to be 100% powered by renewable energy by 2024. The city's fleet ought to be electric or alternative fuel by 2024. The city ought to invest in building more charging stations around the city where people can then begin the transition to hybrid vehicles. We New buildings, we ought to work to have them carbon neutral by 2030. There are a host of other things we ought to do, but I think the most important piece is we ought to be aspirational in our goals, and as mayor, that's what I'll be. But what's more important is to have an annual report that demonstrates the progress we're making on those goals. Because the problem we have with this administration is they have a neat plan and a bunch of lofty goals and aspirational goals, but we're not anywhere close to meeting them, nor will we meet them. And so accountability is important when you deal with that issue. If we move to more public transportation that's strong and affordable and accessible, uh, we will clean up a lot of the emissions going on. Uh, I also would invest more in solar power. We're the sunniest city ever. There's no reason that we should be uh, relying on fossil fuels to power. Uh, and then I think we all have agreed up here that we should be paying for our trash and that recycling and composting should be free. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we could actually be using that compost uh, and the recycling in order to break our waste down into energy clean energy. I want to, I want to, you know, the transit, the, the solar are critical. Um, I also think um, how we build and our building code, and I agree with Penn on converting the buildings. We also have to talk about fracking. Um, no fracking in Denver. I think the, the emissions from places like Suncor, which have largely gone um, untalked about by this administration, even though it brings air quality issues here. And also, it's very important that we're looking at the environmental issues around dirt. I mean, I was down looking at the I-70 construction project, watching them haul out um, trucks full of dirt uncovered through the neighborhoods, and we don't know what's in that soil. So these types of things, we have to, we have to get much more conscious about our environmental impacts right now. Okay, good. So I, we've come to the part of this debate where each of you um, has an opportunity to ask one other um, person on the stage uh, a question, and that person has a minute to respond, and then you two can um, debate for another minute. Um, well, almost another minute, 45 seconds. So let's start with you, Penn. Okay. Um, Jamie, let's talk about your transit plan, and I know a key feature of that is trolley cars. Mm -hmm. I think you've talked about or, or rail. Um, my concern is given the problem we've seen RTD have with the A line and other rail crossings in the mix with streets, I, I, I don't think it's viable to do that now. Explain why you think it is. Well, I think it's, it's absolutely viable. Other cities have figured out how to do it. We're seeing cities across the country reinvest in fixed rail systems. I have said all along, well, I think streetcars are um, the focus of my transit plan and should be the spine of an intracity transit network that we recognize there's probably going to have to be a mix of modes. And as long as we're focused on connecting all those modes back to regional transit, that's the big thing. For me, the re reason I like the fixed rail, we've seen in other cities that it has brought economic opportunity when there's a fixed system people invest they invest in business opportunities they invest in higher density residential along those um, along those rail lines and let me let me ask this yeah. one of the problems i have with that approach is fixed rail systems have an incrementally greater cost up front in order to build them mm -hmm. and this is a state that's pe voted down two transportation measures in the last election cycle. How do we fund it? Five seconds, Jamie. 
we're going to have to fund it with a, a mix of uh, a capital stack that's very diverse. We've talked about fees on Uber and Lyft, uh, fees potentially on car registrations, potentially a sales tax, potentially putting our parking revenues into an enterprise fund and reinvesting them. But it's going to be a complicated capital stack no matter what type of okay. transportation system we fund. Kaylin. Jamie, I, have a, I want to give you an opportunity to ask, to answer a question that I asked earlier. I have mm -hmm. a group of friends who were uh, kicked out of a DIY safe space mm -hmm. overnight. Uh, it was snowing. You brought them Starbucks gift cards. Did you ever receive the message from Colin Ward, who has since killed himself? Uh, did you ever get his message thanking you for the gift card? So just to clarify, when Rhinoceropolis happened, when the eviction happened, um, I was the first call out from the neighborhood side, from the district side, out to figure out what was going on. And we reached out to um, leadership at the city to address the issue. Did you get the thank you note? I never got a thank you note from Colin. Uh, Ayo Jamie, I'm gonna need another cup or mill in Starbucks gift card. A chopper, bunch of 3D printers, entire parking garage is lit with tropical aquarium, bird sanctuary, and aviaries and indoor and outdoor, blah, 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 blah. It's a really great letter that I would love to give you. Excellent. I would love to have it. My and real question was, and I know you got cut off in the last debate, if you were mayor, what would you do to protect artists in this city from being pushed out and displaced from the same uh, art districts that they help create? 20 need, seconds, Jamie, sorry. So how many? 20. Okay. Well, we need, to, we need to actually be willing to invest in subsidizing artist housing and artist space. We need to fix our code and zoning because that is the problem. There is no space in our code and zoning, and the city is systematically using that to push people out of spaces. Okay. But we need to invest in subsidized space for artists. Chairman Seku, welcome back. What's your question? I had to use the bathroom. <laughs> I hope you don't think I was mad at nobody. All right, here we go. One, one question to one candidate. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. You weren't here when we were talking about this. I don't mean I don't know. Okay. I've been through this before. All right. Here we go, Penn. Look in. You're talking about a transportation system. Do you, on a regular, ride the bus or the train? No. No. Not anymore. All right, not anymore. When was the last time you rode a bus or a train? Three weeks ago? When was Three that? Three weeks ago. Is that right, Kaylin? Three weeks ago? And yeah. would you say on the average you do that maybe once or twice a year? Bus or train? Uh, maybe once or twice a year. Yeah, so explain to me. This is my question. How are you going to come up, based on your experience of once or twice a year, riding the buses and the train, a solution to a problem that on the transportation system that you don't even use yourself? I use the bus, I use the train, and I do something better than that okay. because that's trifling. Well, I uh, walk and I can get there quickly. Let him answer the, the question, right. please. I'll answer your question. No, no, that's a good question. And frankly, Sekou, I'll tell you, I'm the perfect person to work on a solution because transit doesn't work for me. When I first came back to Denver from law school, I caught the bus, I commuted on the 23 every day for three years because it was convenient, it was timely, and it ran consistently, and it got me within two blocks of where I was going downtown and two blocks from my office. I could get on the bus and get two blocks from home. You can't do that anymore in large parts of the city. Rail doesn't work for me. By the time I drive to a rail station, I'm almost downtown anyway. Sorry, Pat. That's how I know. Be Lisa, authentic, man. If you ain't going to use it, Chairman you Seku, else to your use question it, is I over. Do that with any kind of leadership Please and stop. Integrity. Lisa, your question. Yeah, my question is for Jamie. You recently attended a Healing the Hood event um, with um, to, uh, around issues of gang violence and reducing and, and you know, peaceful interactions. Um, I lost a friend to gang violence in Park Hill. Um, it actually helped to start my uh, political activism because um, it, because it was hurtful. Mm -hmm. So to see someone come and take a photo op, um, I've done the work in my community around trying to reduce gang violence, worked with Reverend Kelly, volunteered at Red Shield. What have you done to reduce gang violence before you went to that park to take a photo with folks whose lives are impacted, sometimes tragically, around those issues. 
Do you know that I was invited to the park? That wasn't Butter my question. The, well, it wasn't a photo op. Butterfly reached out to me, and she said, will you please come to this event? My question is, I will what answer have your you question. Done? I'll answer your question, but I'm going to clarify the statement first, Lisa. So I don't asked a question. I and asked I'll answer you a question. It. You're not great at answering questions okay, you guys either. are wasting your time. Butterfly invited me to that event. I think I got my answer. And I attended because she asked me to be yeah. there. That's I'm not there an to listen. That's what leaders do. I can't have been in everybody's shoes. I'm not in a wheelchair, but I understand Kaylin. I have not, never had anybody impacted by gang violence, but I need to listen to people who have. I've never been on the street, but I'll work with the people that are on the street. It's my job to show up and listen. I didn't ask for my photo to be taken. I was there to listen, and I was there for two hours having conversations with people Jamie. before we had to be at the next event. Your question. Just want to clear the I record. Thank Thanks. you. Your you question. answered my question. Last question. Nothing. Oh, my God. I'm trying to ask a question. Jamie, you can ask a question now. Yeah, go Okay. All right. So um, recently, you have been asked a number of times on Initiative 300. Are you addressing me? Where you stand. I am addressing okay. you. Because yeah. you just said you, so I wasn't sure you're pointing in my direction, but you're addressing me? OK. Fight over there. Dr. Calderon, <laughs> recently, you have been asked about Initiative 300. Mm -hmm. And a number of times, you have said, um, I don't take stands on initiatives. I don't endorse initiatives. Mm -hmm. As mayor, you are all, we are always going to be asked, um, oftentimes by city council, to stand behind or, or not initiatives that come through. Mm -hmm. So I just want to understand from your perspective, um, how do you make that decision? How do you step up? Because to me, leadership on the campaign trail means taking hard stands and making hard decisions. Mm -hmm. And leadership in the mayor's office does too. So mm -hmm. I just want you to clarify that. Yeah, I appreciate the question. And leadership isn't just taking stands when you're running for mayor. I have a 30-year history of taking stands um, and public service in this city that I was born and raised in. Um, so I didn't say I don't take uh, positions on initiatives. What I said was I was not endorsing any initiatives or candidates in the May race. I'm focusing on my race. And I also said, having said that, I support the principles behind 300. Um, I support the sentiment behind 300. And I know why it was created, because of the city's failures. And I also said I would vote for it. OK, good. Quick lightning round, because we're, we're going to cut the lightning round a bit short. And this needs to be, these questions need to be answered in less than 10 words. If you're going over 10 words, somehow my head is going to know that, and I'm going to cut you off, OK? Mm -hmm. So Jamie, let's start with you. Okay. Um, and a yes or a no would be good on some of these. Um, what's, it, I'm not going to ask, what's your position on Initiative 300, the urban camping ban? I'm going to ask, how are you voting on that initiative? I'm voting no. No. No on 300. Uh, it, I agree with the sentiment, but it's not a solution, no. I'm voting yes. I fully support and endorse 300. Of course I'm going to vote for it. As a matter of fact, I'm organizing it. Yes. OK, next question. I'm going to start with you, Penfield. How are you voting on Initiative 301, which is decriminalizing magic mushrooms in Denver? I'm voting no. Kaylin. Yes. I'm taking the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> yes, I believe in decriminalization. No. OK. Name one thing in 10 words or less. Kaylin, you start. That Mayor Michael Hancock, who's not here to defend himself, unfortunately, um, has succeeded at as mayor. Oh, being a sanctuary city and opening uh, the rec centers free to youth. To who? To the youth. OK, got it. Seku. Building opposition so we can come up with a solution. So I want to thank Welcome Michael. None of us will be up. All right. <laughs> Lisa. He succeeded in creating a city for the wealthy. Jamie. Um, I think he has been successful in supporting the immigrant community. Penn. I, I like making rec centers free for kids. OK, good. Last lightning round question. Let's start with Seku, is it this time? Mm -hmm. No, it's her turn. No, it's no, your turn. She started. Look, we want you to talk, man. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> no, you don't. Do you support an elected sheriff? 
Huh? Do you support electing rather than appointing a sheriff? No, you got You don't want to politicize the office, man. There's enough out there going on already. Okay, no, Lisa. Yes, we're one of the few jurisdictions in the nation that doesn't elect, and I'm for checks and balances. So the people should vote them in or out. Jamie, I don't think we should elect our sheriff. I think we just need good appointments and good leadership from the mayor's office. Penn. Colorado Springs had an elective sheriff that had a whole bunch of problems. So whether you elect or appoint isn't the issue, it's the person. We no. elect our mayor no. too. Kaylin. Whoa, come Guys. on, now, give me five on that. Oh, that's getting Guys. Guys. Kaylin. Yes, I, I would like to see the community uh, elect the sheriff. Okay, good. Um, now we're at the point where you all have um, a minute and a half to close, wrap up. Um, Seku, you start. All right, listen, if you can see me, I've got every campaign button for everybody up here on me. I'm calling for a united front amongst the progressive forces to occupy city government and do what your passion is. Everybody up here is qualified to be the mayor, all right? For real, for real. That's like everybody's qualified to be the president of the United States, all right? So it don't take much. But what we have is serious, committed, and uh, wonderful people who will make a great team. So instead of us competing, what I'm doing, I'm offering all of y'all a job, all right? <laughs> right now. And y'all, we can quit all this right now, go to work right now, cancel the election, it's over because we're the only ones running, so who else they going to get to do this, right? And then we end, because I'm telling you right now, right, this is about teamwork. And it's teamwork that makes the dream work, not the competition, the cooperation. And we've got to bring all the progressive forces together to fight what's there, because what's there ain't going to be over after this election. They are organized, Jack, and the pendulum's going to come on a counter coup. And look out, Jack, because really the only way you're going to win this and secure it is you've got to arm the people and you've got to repeal the ban on open carry and conceal because this one's going to be done at gunpoint. Lisa. <laughs> we, now tell me I'm lying. <laughs> we are on the cusp of a new era of leadership. The fact that we are going to enter one of our most important elections for some in their lifetime uh, because it's going to determine the future direction of the city. We don't have four more years for Michael Hancock. Many of us won't be here. Uh, it's also a new opportunity to elect for the first time in Denver history a woman. I've already made history by being the first woman of color on the ballot. Um, and so let's keep going. We can have a gender responsive uh, government. We can um, put people who've been marginalized outside of the margins in the center, and we can have a more compassionate city to create more opportunities for more people. I don't want to return to the administrations of the past. I want to look to the future. I want to have opportunities for millennials that, uh, that I had that my daughter doesn't have. I want to put the environment first. Um, and so we're able to do this, let's, so let's go in a new direction. Um, so vote for Lisa Calderon for Denver mayor. <laughs> Jamie. Thank you. This is, this is an incredible moment. This is an incredible election. And I think between the number of people running for mayor and the number of people who are running for city council, what we're seeing is a call for new leadership across the board. And I think it's desperately needed. We have ridden a growth wave that the mayor praises as um, him having taken steps to bring us out of the recession. But we throttled up and we forgot to lift everybody up along the way. And that's what we need to refocus on now. I'm not anti-development or anti-growth. Cities are living, breathing things. They change, they evolve. Everybody needs to be at the table to make sure that it's done right. And every voice needs to count in that conversation. We're gonna get the best by bringing conflicting points of view together. And that's how we're gonna learn and how we're gonna grow. So I'm refocusing the conversation on being the most livable Denver, on high quality of life, on building a city that's economically sustainable to stand the, the changes that will come, that's inclusive, that, that everybody gets to be part of the, the conversation and part of the solution, and that's accountable and transparent to our taxpayers, and truly ethical from the top. Our mayor needs to be personally and professionally ethical as a leader of the city. Jamie Gillis, I would love to have your vote on May 7th. Thank you.
Thank you. Penn. Uh, well, thank you, Susan, and thank you to the host for sponsoring this event. My name is Penfield Tate, and I'd be honored to have your vote and serve as your next mayor in this city. As we have visited in the community, you've made it clear you want change and you want it now. We've had 16 years of this administration either in the mayor's office or in City Hall, and you've said enough is enough, you want new leadership. My commitment to you all is to bring leadership that is accessible, that is ethical, that is transparent, because we have a number of issues that we need to address, and I would offer to you this isn't the time for on-the-job training. I have the experience in the legislature where I've carried bills that have funded affordable housing. I've carried bills that have called for master planning communities. And I've carried bills to deal with some of the other social issues that ail us. I worked for a former mayor, so I understand how city government works. And I worked on the cabinet of a governor. As I indicated before, I've managed multi-billion dollar budgets, so this is not something that is new to me. This isn't the time for on-the-job training. We need to move forward. And like many of you, I mean, I'm a father, I'm a parent also, I share your concerns about the future of the city. It's becoming far too expensive, far too gentrified, and there are many of us who are sitting here now who won't be here in another four years if we don't get a change. I would offer to you, we can't do another four minutes of this, much less another four years. So I'd humbly respect your vote and your support. Penfield Tate for Mayor. Check out our platform at tateforDenver.com. Thank you. Thank you. Kaylin, wrap it up. Susan, thank you for having us. Everyone here at Denver Media, all the independent media and artists in this building, I promise if I'm mayor, I will renew the lease on this also day one with the urban camping ban being overturned. Uh, I jumped into this as an artist, um, as also the first queer woman with a disability uh, who's going to be on the ballot. This is a very historic race. Lisa and I uh, met before she jumped in the race and we're very excited to increase the voter turnout in this city. Uh, we hope to give Mayor Hancock a big run for his money. Um, and you can see that within this civic, civic engagement that we wanna see people have the opportunity to vote for somebody that they trust, so vote for somebody that they have a relationship with and have had a relationship with before the campaign. Um, we are doing everything we can to take money out of politics and to show what you can do with campaign funds and energy with all the money that we've raised, even though it's very limited. We've fed hundreds of unhoused neighbors. We have created art in the city. We've built ramps and we believe that politics aren't gonna save us and it's what you do now and what you do yourself that are gonna outlive this whole election cycle. Please follow the Kaylin number four mayor campaign. We hope this will uh, live long past this election cycle and uh, thank you again for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank all of you. This is, I believe, your 29th debate, 29th. or is this the 30th? 29th. Wow. And how, and I, well, I got 10 in because it wouldn't let me participate. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and so, <laughs> why, how many more do you, hold on quickly, how many more do you have left? Okay, so I just want to thank all of you so much because you must be exhausted and kind of sick of each other. Um, no. I know, no. I, I, not you. What but, is um, I also want to thank our live audience for being here um, and for your fabulous questions. I want to remind the viewers at home that ballots should have arrived by mail. If they haven't, please contact the city election division. Um, you can return them. Uh, by mail at 70 cents a postage stamp. You can also return them um, at several city locations, Denver Election Division um, page. I think it's called denverbotes.org, maybe. If it's not, I'm sorry to Alton Dillard. And um, I want to remind everyone, if your friends or family want to view this later and you're not uh, watching it live stream and they just didn't weren't here tonight or couldn't watch it live, they can go to the... Uh, Denver Open Media website, and they can also listen on KGNU um, a tape recording of, of it as well. Thank you all for being with us, and good luck thank to you, all of you. Thank you.